awesome. So where are you originally from? Um, Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh. I, um, yeah, I went to college in Pittsburgh and then just ended up staying there. I grew up in upstate New York and Syracuse. Um, but then I re- like I went to college in Pittsburgh. Um, I stayed there. I would live there from like 96 until I guess 2014. Um, and then I moved to Brooklyn for a year. And then after that, I've been on the West Coast ever since. That's a that's a big uh I mean jump within uh within those years at in Pittsburgh. Yeah, I mean I shit. The last year I lived in Pittsburgh, I think I moved like three times and then I had to move <laughs> I when I lived in Brooklyn, um I had this really fucked up thing happen to me. So I had to move within the year that I lived in Brooklyn, I had this guy die in my apartment while I was on tour. Um, yeah. was it, I, was it one, was it somebody that you knew or was you no, roommate? No, I put, so I, a friend of mine passed this apartment on to me and it was for the location. It was insanely cheap. And I lived by myself, which was like unheard of. I'm sure it's still like that. I think rent has gone down a little bit since the pandemic, but at that time it was like 1100 a month for a, a two bedroom apartment that I had all to myself. Wow. In Brooklyn, and, was that rent controlled? Is that, is that how it got passed down? Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, and cause he passed it on to me. So he was technically on, the that's like a whole other story, but so I was going on tour a lot. Um, and I was just like, I should just put this on Craigslist. I was originally going to Airbnb it, but I didn't have time to set it up. So for this one three week tour, I put it on Craigslist. People, I actually put it up for like two hundred dollars more than my rent, so I made money off of it for sure. just three weeks. And um, yeah, all these people responded instantly, and I picked seemingly the most normal, the bunch, this IT guy from Staten Island, um, who like you know, just nerdy, regular IT guy with like dress pants and a button down shirt. And then fast forward to three weeks later. The night before I got back to New York, my friend who passed the place on to me called me at like midnight freaking out Um, because he just, he just gotten out of a movie and he's like, I just turned on my phone. I have all these missed calls and texts from people I used to know in the building about this crazy smell coming from the apartment. And so they just called the cops and the cops just came and found a dead body. And it turns out this this motherfucker was huffing dust off. And he basically like asphyxiated himself on my couch and died. And this is in August, so you know it gets really, really hot in New York in August. Oh so yeah. He must have the, the detective was like, yeah, he was probably there for like I would say three days, and then the rest of the time he just sat there decomposing. He's like, it was real bad, man. His face like melted off. <laughs> it's like, I, yeah. He's like, I got a picture if you want to see it. Which at the time I was pretty freaked out, so I didn't. But now I'm. Maybe I'll call him up. Yeah, you I, should. I mean, you know what? I, I'm second thought. It's a shitty situation, but yeah, I would kind of want to see that photo. Yeah. I mean, it must be pretty I mean, gnarly it, for sure. It was. It was, and that wasn't even like. It was. They got rid of the body, obviously, but. You know, my couch was, it was like one of those Ikea futon type things. Um, and that was just soaked in like corpse juice, <laughs> you know, like oh. all his body fluids that like leaked out. And so it was still pretty fucking gnarly. Like the smell was insane. You know, the, even the detective, he almost threw up and he gave me that classic line. He's like, tell you what, man, you never get used to that smell. You're like, what the fuck am I in? Fucking Law and Order? Wait, why? <laughs> yeah, serious. No, and he had like, he was seriously like this old hardened Brooklyn detective with a long trench coat, just like had a toothpick. Smoking butts yeah. inside. He's like, just I that, don't like, know. Yeah. <laughs> if he, I, he would have been too stereotypical for Law and Order, actually. Oh, wow. So maybe a Blue Bloods kind of guy then. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> wow, man. That, anyway, that's crazy. So, yeah. 
So, so what did you, what did you do with the apartment after that? Like, like, did you, I mean, I'm, you moved obviously, but I moved. Yeah. But I ended up having to clean it up myself because the landlord didn't want to have anything to do with it. Oh. And, uh, I had friends who lived two floors above who just had a baby and they were like kind of freaking out because the smell had started creeping up into their place. You know, there are all these flies and like maggots all over the couch. So oh. I just did it like Breaking Bad style. Went to Home Depot and got coveralls and like a bunch of bleach. And actually, here's a tip. If you ever need to clean up blood or like any sort of animal protein, Dawn dish soap and peroxide. It has to be plain on dish soap and peroxide will get rid of any like bodily fluid or blood. Cause wow, there were streaks. Okay. I had a, you know, it was like wood floors. So there were streaks where they pulled the body into the body bag. And um, so yeah, just like scrub the floors with that. I, um, I chopped up the, uh, the mattress part of the futon and put it in like industrial, you know, those like contractor grade garbage bags and yeah. bleach on and curbed it, which is highly illegal. Probably shouldn't admit this, but I mean, it's been like six years. No, no, no. It was your um, friend, right? Yeah. That's what you're saying, right? Yeah. It's, it's your yeah. My friend, <laughs> whose name I won't say, but yeah. John Doe from John, X, actually. John Doe yeah. from X did it. Yeah, he's going to get, I'm going to get John Doe arrested. Anyway, yeah, he, so like, just <laughs> threw him on the curb, you know, which is highly illegal because it's a biohazard you're supposed to have a professional cleanup crew come and take care of that <laughs> and like i did that and i took the i smashed up the frame and took it down to a dumpster and like you know sprayed bug spray to get rid of the flies and maggots and um i like lit some sage and everything and you could actually kind of feel the the like juju in the room transform it was kind of actually cathartic because it really freaked me out for like you know, the that whole week, every anytime I was walking down the sidewalk, I would just see this guy's face on people walking by me. It was Whoa. totally it was surreal. That's so crazy. Like, yeah, seriously, like it was a pretty dark, dark time. <laughs> yeah, who did you help? But to I have get, a good story uh, to tell. Yeah, no, please. Uh, but real, who did you get to um to uh, help you? move the 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 couch itself did you just oh, I, did, your buddies? I did that all my i did it all myself oh yours a like one man job soprano style yeah, man. yeah exactly yeah that's that's fucking I crazy i wouldn't have subjected any of my friends to that i was crashing on a bunch of people's couches around that time anyway because i just didn't want to stay there anymore it makes you think twice about what what's going on in those couches though you know i know seriously <laughs> so you're yeah you, you're originally from New York, though, yeah? Is, is that what you said, right? Yeah, from upstate New York. Upstate. Yeah. And, and, and you were there until you were 18, until you went to college? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Nice. What What were you getting into up there? Like, what What, what was what were some of your things that you would like to do? Um, I, it was a pretty, pretty normal, like, middle-class, white, suburban upbringing. You know, like, I played football all throughout high school. Um, but then I really, I really got into music probably when I was, I was really into rap, um, in like the late eighties, you know, I really liked Public Enemy and De La Soul. And then a few years after that, I discovered Led Zeppelin and Black Sabbath and I was just like obsessed. Um, and to the point where like oh in the who also um and I kind of like yeah <laughs> but yeah i kind of like i became obsessed especially with drums because all three of those bands you know it's like the drums feature pretty prominent and uh yeah i kind of it, my dad was he kind of got me into music when i was a kid he sang in a, a garage rock band when he's a teenager, but he wasn't, he, he would still sing every now and then, but he wasn't like a musician. Um, but he still sings actually to this day. Um, but like he had a really good record collection. So I started like going through his record collection and just kind of really becoming obsessed with like classic rock. Um, and so he got me this 
cheapo drum set and he was surprised that i kind of i just picked it up like almost instantly um so i never really took lessons actually i took my first lesson seven years ago um but like all you know up until then i never taken any lessons uh did you so, understand yeah. what they're asking you to do in those lessons you're like i got this like i understand what it was this- yeah the guy actually he was really cool he was a jazz drummer and um the first lesson was us just shooting the shit and he sat me you know we sat down and he was like all right so what do you want what are you what are you looking to get out of this and i told him like i just wanted to play looser i want to play more like breakbeat type stuff and so he had me set up his drums he's like set them up the way you normally would and just play me something and so he watched me play for a few minutes he's like well okay right off the bat you're like your hi-hat's too high if you want to play these like kind of sizzly hi-hat beats lower your hi-hat you know like see how much easier it is just all these really simple things that i never even thought about because i didn't have anybody to teach me um and he was like, you know, and like loosen up your wrist. It's like dribbling a basketball. You know, you don't like force the ball down. You like gravity do all the work. And so these little, just those little things, just more like conceptual techniques completely like changed the game. I took a, a couple more lessons from him, but that's all. I just, I knew I needed something to like change things up for me a little bit. And it really, it really helped. And he taught me some rudiments, which I'd never practiced before. Yeah, you, anyway, you, know, you do those paradiddles. It's like, yeah. yeah, left, left, right, yep. Yeah, yeah, I get it. I know the terms. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, so I, when I got my drums and I kind of instantly learned how to play, I actually joined a band right away and I played my first show like three months after I got a drum set. <laughs> wow. Um, what what was what was your first band called? Oh, it was called midnight special <laughs> we just we played like it was all covers you know it was like i remember we played james gang rolling stones um what else god oh we played a who song it's just classic rock classic oh, shit. the good stuff yeah man yeah we're, which we're, is funny because at that time like all my other friends were into like Cause you know, it was, this was like 1994. So like 93, 94. So obviously like everybody was into Nirvana and Pearl Jam. And I fucking hated that shit. I still do. Right. Like I hate that drumming. I hate this, the production. I hate the way they like Smashing Pumpkins, you know, like those fucking singers drive me up the wall, like all those guys. And so, yeah, I was just like, and I knew that all those guys were into like Black Sabbath and Led Zeppelin and stuff like that too. But I was like, this is just so much better, you know? Yeah, definitely. Uh, it's it's the bands that inspire those bands that you don't like, which are the bands that you do like. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and that, I mean, that, that comes across even like today, I feel like in some bands, like, eh. Not so much their sound, but the sound that influenced that sound. Yeah, like that's that's what I like. Yeah, it's funny. I see a lot of like a lot of these bands in LA who are like kind of garagey, but you could tell you could tell a lot of those people were like super into pop punk when they were teenagers. So it's like they got into the good stuff later. You know, like they discovered the Stooges and like maybe Black Flag or whoever later on, but like. You could tell there's like it's like filtered through this these like pop punk foundations or whatever you want to call it. Which that that was a whole like I'm glad I I missed the boat on that. I mean it'll always come back around. It's not too late. (laughs) No, actually like that stuff is just really funny. It doesn't offend me. It's just I hear it, I'm like what the fuck you know it's like guys in their 30s trying to sound like teenagers it's fucking hilarious like, <laughs> i forgot the accommodation to my walker it's like dude you're 35 like yeah what, what, are, you, what are you talking about man <laughs> it's, it's seriously like i can't 
it's like when you listen to really good heavy metal and it's it's so it's just funny like the stuff that's really trying to be evil is fucking hilarious yeah it's like a similar similar thing for me right what um so how much of a transition was it from uh upstate new york down to uh to pennsylvania i mean like what what was that shift like it was i mean that was the first time i lived in a city um which was really cool because that's when i met all the true freaks and it's when i like i'd never you know like i'd never been to a punk show before syracuse had this like vegan hardcore scene which is like earth crisis and shit like that that just didn't really register with me um but like the fr- <laughs> actually the first punk show i went to was anal cunt <laughs> and um the uh the bass player i can't remember if he like his bass broke or his amp broke but he got all pissed off and he just like walked off and so it was just drums guitar and the singer and it was it was so bad but it was the most entertaining show i've ever seen because somebody had they sounded like shit you know there's no bass player and they're just really sloppy and they were all fucked up um and somebody had puked in a bucket and i don't know how the bucket made its way to the stage but the singer took the bucket and just like threw it on the floor and there were these punks doing like slip and slide in the puke on the floor and i was like this is awesome who brought the bucket it's like i know i'm gonna puke and you know <laughs> or like, what? So, yeah I, I don't i don't know where it came, or maybe it was staged i don't know all i remember is somehow a bucket of puke presented itself and the singer just took it and like there was seriously like just this like large empty space in <laughs> like in front of the stage that nobody wanted it's probably like if you went to go see Gigi allen nobody would get within like 50 feet of the stage, you know, but everybody still didn't want to like, they wanted to watch the train wreck. I was going to say that's a, it's gotta be heavy influence on that. Yeah. <laughs> that, but, that um, shock rock. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> but yeah, I thought that I, that was awesome. And like, you know, there were two really good college radio stations because this was, you know, I hate to be that guy, but it was before the internet. So like you still have to go to record stores or listen to like college radio to, or have friends with really good taste to turn you on to stuff. And like Syracuse didn't have any, any underground radio. So I kind of just got exposed to like um, a bunch of stuff that I hadn't heard before, you know, like, like good punk music and noise and um, you know, like, like the Gories or Blues Explosion stuff like you know like or like those early fat possum records um yeah so that kind of and then i just and then i met people who had like similar tastes as me and like started bands that i actually thought were cool and, um, was this in new york or was this in pennsylvania this, this was in this is all in pittsburgh oh, okay so i played in like a million different bands in pittsburgh up to that point were you did you just play it that those couple of shows with your first band? Yeah, yeah. And but you, then, I mean, um, and you still kept it up. I mean, playing drums, right? Yeah, the whole time. Um, and so, yeah, like once I started, like my buddy and I started a band in Pittsburgh, and we were just playing at like college parties, um, which is actually really cool because they got pretty rowdy, and we were playing like. You know, like Stooges-y, garagey type stuff, to like a lot of just drunk squares and like brat dudes. But you know, they're like, "Fuck yeah, she rocks, you rock, bro." Um, <laughs> and that's your audience now. It's it's just, it's yeah, just seri- yeah, seriously. Yeah, <laughs> seriously. I know. like that's kind of no. Honestly, there's a lot of a lot of similarities, and I think. That's what's really cool about John, you know, like, um, when even like the bigger non-festival shows that we play, we like, we come out on stage, we set up our own gear, we like kind of fiddle around, like do a sound check, 
and it never feels like show busy you know like it's never like we don't it's not like some bands you go to see and the first time you see them is when they like the lights go down and they come out and there's this grand show busy entrance it's more just really laid back and it even though they're these big venues it feels like playing at a house party and um it's it's pretty awesome because it takes that pressure away you know especially for bigger shows where um if you walk out on stage and all of a sudden you just see a couple thousand people it's like sometimes your nerves get the best of you and it takes like two or three songs to kind of ease into it um yeah you're, you're fixing your high hat and stuff i get it yeah oh man yeah <laughs> dude i have these i still have i i have stress dreams all the time where like i go out on stage and my drums aren't set up and like everybody you know it's like a sold out show and everybody in the band's like come on hurry the fuck up and i'm like frantically like trying to set up my drums and like my hi-hat stand breaks and i'm like sitting there trying to fix it and then like the crowd starts thinning out they get impatient they start leaving and then like and then like the band members start leaving and i'm like ah. <laughs> That's I've had that dream so many times. Oh man, it, it, is it like the same place every time that you have it? It's like, oh shit, I'm I'm back at this venue. It's, no, no, it's all every time it's a different place. Sometimes it's with bands I haven't played with in years, or you know, it's a big reunion show, and uh, <laughs> it's like a big deal. You know, like all these important people are there, and like it's being filmed. Yeah, it's it's different every time, but the pressure is is always really high for some reason oh man that's crazy you wake up really oh shit no that's not that's not happening yeah or, yeah you just you just gotta wake I, up out of it i wait yeah usually it gets so like my heart is beating so fast that i wake up and it's such a relief I'm like oh <laughs> i mean that yeah that must be like a just an instant like relief like all right it's, yeah it's fine <laughs> all right note to self make sure i had stand is always intact <laughs> yeah oh man hi-hat stands for me it's just i i've gone through so many and they're just it's, i just keep on getting shitty ones because like i, I yeah, think like, all right i'm gonna get the best one i'm gonna get like a whatever 200 dollars one i'm like ah there's one for 75 bucks i'll make it work no dude i i learned that the hard way make make the investment i have i have one that actually is it's really annoying because it's so heavy duty it's like the heaviest part of my all my stands um and it weighs down my cymbal bag it's like it feels like it's half the weight of the entire cymbal bag but or cymbal stands bag but like it's it's so worth it i've had it for like seven years i think and it's it's a tank it's never failed me what what brand is it never. um jesus that's a good one. <laughs> I could go. I could go show you. No, it's, come on! But I'm trying to give even... you some free shit, man. I'm trying to have you plug some. Oh yeah. <laughs> some it's stuff. uh. I guess. Who even made? Dude, I'm so bad with gear. Um, is it DW? Yeah, it's a DW. Well, yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, right. DW. It's not. I used to have the one with two legs, which are actually those are cool. Um, but this one has it's like just as heavy duty as that with three, and the thing, um. The thing that really makes it is it has these teeth that you can lower. And if you have your drum, if you, you know, if you put all your drums on a rug, those teeth will like sink into the rug and they'll never, ever move. Well, that's, that's good. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Shout out to, to DW, right? Yeah. All right. Good. Yeah. Sponsor so, me. Yeah. There you go. That's what I was looking for. Yeah. Just, <laughs> just a nice throw out for a sponsorship. <laughs> I'll send, yeah, I'll email you. Once, after this interview, I'll go inside and I'll, I'll figure out the exact model. Oh, yeah, and please. You can, can just hype it up. Please do. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll tag them in the post and everything. Yeah, hey, DW. <laughs> just relentlessly. I'm just going to say they sponsor this podcast and like, do we fucking sponsor this podcast? And then like, they just, just send shit like, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. We're, we're happy to work with you. Uh, <laughs> I'm so bad at that, man. I, I should do like self-promotion and stuff like that just does not come naturally to me. But then I see people getting free stuff. I'm like, okay, that could be cool, I guess. But yeah, it's all, it's all, I mean, 
you can you can you can get it. We'll 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 get it to you. They'll they'll send it over to me. I'll send it over to you. Yeah. There you go. So you you're out there in Joshua Tree right now, yeah? I am, yeah. I can tell by the trees. I'm I'm a, <laughs> I'm an arborist. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, Yucca Valley specifically. Nice. What's what's the address? What's the cross streets? <laughs> <laughs> um well it's first my social security number. Yeah, but you're with LifeLock, right? Right? You're, you're with LifeLock and which is another <laughs> another sponsor of this podcast. <laughs> no, but uh when did you make the move uh from from Pittsburgh to, to California? Yeah, I I had a stopover in Reno for like 4 months and then um I went to LA. Um and yeah, I bought this house like July, uh July of 2019. Just as kind of, just have a place to, I have, I had an apartment in LA that I rented, um, but I just, I wanted to buy a house and houses here at that time were pretty cheap. And I, as it turns out, I got it in just the nick of time because like since the pandemic, people have just been fleeing, not just LA, but San Francisco, San Diego, it seems like all up and down the West coast. And so price, like, property values here skyrocketed and i actually don't know if i could have like i i i don't know if i could afford a place had i just tried like had i tried to come in now and bought a place i don't think i think i would have been priced out right um so yeah i got it just in the nick of time and then yeah once the pandemic hit it's like there's really no reason for me to be in la so i've been here permanently for like since last march Oh wow! Uh, when you first moved to California, it was directly to LA. Yeah, and and did did you have a preconceived notion like I I'm gonna go here to do something, or were you like ah, I just want to be out there? Yeah, I wanted to. I wanted to play drums in a rock and roll band again, because um, I had been I've been playing drums for a band called Chick 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 for like at that point for like seven years and uh and it was cool like i you know i like i like dance music and i like disco and i like funk music um which is what they played just all like different types of dance music and um but i really i was like all my friends who played rock music lived in la um and I had another project called Warm Drag, um, just a duo with my friend Vashti, and she had just moved to LA. So I was like, and then, you know, this shit happened with the dead guy in New York. Everything just kind of seemed to be pointing me towards the direction of LA. Yeah. And, um, and so, yeah, I moved out there, and she and I started playing shows, and, um, before I had a chance to really play with anybody else, I got a call from out of the blue from Dwyer, like asking me to come jam at his house because he had a little studio. And unbeknownst to me, it was actually an audition. Um, he, he was just like, let's jam because we had mutual friends. Um, somebody was like, hey, you should, you should hook up with Dwyer when you're out there. And um, yeah, he called me out of the blue and he's like, hey, you want to come? I want to record some damaged bug stuff. And so like I went over to his house and I brought my sampler just for the hell of it. Um, and so like I made some, some like percussion rhythms to play along to, but he first was like, he was like, why don't you just play something? I was like, what do you want me to play? He's just play, play anything. And so I played a beat. And then he played it. He's like, play this beat for three minutes and I'll record you. And then he recorded it. And then he had me play on top of it. Um, so it's like, all right. And so I played like another a separate beat on top of it. And it ended up being um, the beat for Static God. So like the part that I play in that song was like the very, it was just the first thing that came to my head when I was at his place. And, um, and then the other beat that I played is the beat that Dan plays. And it wasn't until like, months after I joined the band, John was like, 
He's like, hey, man, remember that that session you did in my house? I actually, like, turned one of those things into a song. And, you know, he, he just basically played bass, like, to the those beats I played. And that's basically how that became that song. And then there wow. was another thing that I recorded that day that actually became a Damaged Bug song that he used for some comp. Um, I think there's like two other beats that I played. I don't know if we, I can't remember if he used them for anything else, but those, those two beats in particular, he ended up using. Yeah. Have you, had you met him um, prior to this? I mean, like, or have you, I mean, you said that you had mutual friends. Did he ever see you yeah. play live? I, ha- I don't know if he saw me play live. Um, I had met him a bunch of times. I saw him, shit, this is maybe like 2000 or 2001. Um, I saw Lightning Bolt in Pittsburgh and Pink and Brown opened up. Oh, wow. But who actually did not like. <laughs> I feel like I would have liked them if Lightning Bolt hadn't been on that show. You know, because they were drums and guitar. Lightning Bolt was drums and guitar. And like, you know, Lightning Bolt is Lightning Bolt. And they sounded kind of similar, so it was hard to watch them and see Lightning Bolt. And and also, John was really obnoxious, and he like climbed this air conditioning duct and like almost, and almost the whole thing almost collapsed. I was like, this fucking guy. And then um, he, he and like we partied at my house after a bunch of people. He doesn't remember that. <laughs> and then how did that I go? Again. Uh, it was pretty mellow. I, nothing crazy happened. And then we met, we hung out again, um, because we both did the 88 Bow Drum, which is Fordham's plus 88 drummers on August 8th, 2008, 8808, you know? And, um, like, a bunch of us partied somewhere, I can't remember, some hotel maybe, afterwards. Um, Yeah, I I brought that up to him, he was like, I don't remember that. (laughs) Like, fair enough, man. Were you... um familiar with john's work i mean pink and brown and like coach whips and hospitals and all that before um, i yeah yeah, i didn't know i didn't know he was in hospitals i'm actually i'm friends with stonehouse and um and i really like all those hospitals like the in the red hospitals records and then hair dryer piece especially it's like really really into and i didn't even know dwyer played with him um, and then Coach Whips, my old band would get compared to them a lot, or I think they would get compared to us because we were around before. I don't know, because um, we were like <laughs> two piece kind of garagey. Um, yeah. But then the first, I actually like the first thing from OCs that I heard was uh, um, the Hounds of Foggy Notion. You know, it's really mellow, and really pretty and like hypnotic i really really like that um, oh yeah yeah with, I, with bridget I saw them. yeah all, yeah Katie. exactly and it's just super mellow and mike and like, sure yeah. yeah and like their vocal harmonies were really beautiful and then i saw them at glasslands in brooklyn and they were just straight up like it was way more rocking <laughs> than i expected because i had only heard that album I was like, oh, so he's like doing back to doing like Coach Whipsy style stuff, but they were really good, and I was a fan. Yeah, I mean, d- definitely, and it, it's so interesting that he he flip flops. I mean, between a lot of different stuff, and like it's it's so funny that he could do mellow stuff and what you guys are doing now, which is like way harder stuff. And yeah, yeah, I mean, he he really dips his finger in all, in everything, which is like great. Yeah, yeah it's, I'm kind of hoping. I'm hoping that when we tour when we start to tour again, now that we've been dipping into the back catalog, like all these older songs, um, I'm hoping we can keep doing that and just have like, just this huge playlist or set list to draw from and like change up set list, you know, do it like Grateful Dead style. Oh yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, when, like, when you say older stuff, is it like from Help and uh, yeah. from that Master's Chamber, all that stuff? Yeah, all that stuff. It, wow. It's been really cool because, um, you know, last year, the only the only shows I played besides one warm drag show back in January was, uh, or maybe it was February. 
No, it's January. Um, besides that, the only like quote shows that I played were those live streams that we did. And um, for each one, he just kind of went back and was like, I've never played this song ever. I've never played this song ever. I haven't played this in years. You know, he he chose the set list. Um, and so like, it was cool for him. He's like, I feel like I'm in a cover band of my own songs. And, you know, like, we weren't sure how it was going to sound because those songs were written for one drummer, but it, ended up all, it all ended up being really cool. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I hope we can keep keep doing that and obviously, like, work on new stuff, too. Yeah, you guys are really putting out a lot of albums right now. I mean, like, wait, it was like four last year, right? Yeah, I, something like that. Which actually, and it wasn't just because of the pandemic. That was that. That was the plan all along. Um, he had talked about doing a remix album before we even went in to record. Um, and then, you know, we had like all these leftover songs. And anytime we record an album, we always have like jams and some other songs that we kind of write on the spot in the studio. So there's always leftover stuff. And he like, you know, and all that's good. <laughs> so he's, you know, might as well release it in some way. Yeah. Um, so ha- had you known Dan prior to uh, playing with him in, in the OC? I did. I did. Um, I, Dan lived with my buddy Vinny, who I knew from Pittsburgh. So I met Dan, like, I met him, I would say, 10 years ago, maybe 11 years ago. Um, and yeah, like I would, we would cross paths every now and then. Um, I was even, I was in Japan at the same time as OCs once. <clears throat> and I went and saw them played. Like Dan and I hung out and got drinks. So yeah, we were, we were buds. Um, wow. That's, that's crazy. Yeah. No, please go ahead. No. Yeah. It's just that, and that's, I think that's part of why we get along so well as far as drumming goes. Cause like a lot of it is, is unspoken, you know, like there are times where he'll kind of take the lead and I'll sit back. There are times where I take the lead and he sits back and we kind of just like, we try and keep that even, you know, like we try and make it so one isn't dominating. Um, and then if something isn't working out, then we talk about it. But for the most part, it's like, it's, it's unspoken. It's kind of just, um, having a mutual respect for each other. Yeah, definitely. How long, uh, did it take to find that groove with one another that like, it's like, okay, like you can, I mean, like you go and take these fills on this and then I'll hang back. Like you were just saying and vice versa. It was it was pretty instant, um, because the when I played with Chick Chick Chick, almost every song I played along to um, electronic percussion patterns, so I was used to playing drums and listening to another beat at the same time. Um, so it wasn't really that drastic of a change for me. I was always you know, I was so used to just locking in with another percussion pattern. So playing with another drummer, uh, it's basically the same thing. I mean, it was like, I had to get used to his feel, but we, the first time we jammed, it only took me like just a few minutes. Um, you know, it's listening while you're playing. It's like playing with any, anybody else, like whether it's guitarist or keyboardist, it's just, playing drums along to another drummer is a little more involved because you kind of there's a lot more that could go wrong <laughs> you know like a, yeah. like it could be a total train wreck um, and so there are definitely there are definitely parts where like we if we're playing the same beat you know like I said earlier when we play older songs and those songs were written with just one drummer. We both, that's when we both play the same beat. And when we do fills, 
oftentimes like, okay, he did a fill here, so I'm going to do a fill here. We trade off. Um, or we'll kind of do like the same fill. Rarely do we do fills at the same time where we're both kind of like doing our own thing because that's when it starts to get a little jumbled sounding. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, that's... Go on. No, no, please, please, please. I, I, I think I keep on jumping that... on you. No, no, no. No, please. no, man. I, 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 I was just going to say like it's... um. That was just those types of things you don't even have to talk about. You just, you, you could just tell, okay, this isn't working. And like within the span of minutes in the same song, it's like, okay, I won't do that again. I was fucked up. <laughs> right. Um, when you, when you say that you guys are doing the same fills, I mean, you'll do something like slightly different than what he's doing. Like he's like, if he ends the fill with like a, with like a, a, a hit on the um on the the floor tom like you'll hit it with like the crash symbol or something like that yeah sometimes okay. we'll do stuff like that or sometimes it'll be the exact same fill um, oh wow it, in synchronicity yeah it just it as long as it's in the same groove it works um for the most part it's kind of it's difficult to describe unless i'm like showing you something specifically but sure sure in, yeah in general that's usually how it works yeah um do you think that that would work with anyone else besides dan yeah i when i was in pittsburgh i played i had this duo it was called italian ice because <laughs> i'm italian and the other guy was he was actually sicilian but um <laughs> yeah we both played full drum kits and he used acoustic drums and he had these electronic drum pads that he would put through guitar pedals um and then i would, i played acoustic drums and i had like pieces of metal um and yeah like it was it was the same thing like he you know the that drummer in pittsburgh he was kind of like a busier drummer so i, I would kind of hold it down a little more and let him do all the kind of like fancy stuff for the most part um but it was the same thing like okay i don't want to overplay and i'm gonna like listen to him the entire time I'm playing and like lock in um yeah and that's exactly what he's doing the whole time as well it's just it's a, it's yeah, a back exactly. and forth yeah right a common like, thing i played i played drums with other drummers before and you can tell when they're not listening and you have to kind of like and it sucks because you have to just kind of like keep up with them um and that's not you need a symbiotic relationship or else it just it's not fun and it doesn't sound good sure um have you gone back to like like for chick to chick for example um have you have you gone back to play a show with them with just you on the drums and is it like a hard transition between playing with dan and just playing by yourself um i didn't i i only played a few i I did both bands at the same time. Like I joined OCs in autumn of 2016. And then in 2017, we both played South by Southwest. And so I did, I put, you know, that whole week I kept bouncing back and forth between bands. Um, but the only time I played, let me think. Oh, you know what? I did those uh, OCS shows where i was the only drummer and yeah it was it it was weird it felt like it felt like i was a, felt like i was under a microscope you know like because i didn't playing with another drummer you have the freedom to fuck up <laughs> you know like if i drop if i drop the beat there's still drumming going on so you can't really tell yeah um and same thing for him. Like we joke about that all the time, unless you fuck up really bad, um, which both of us have done. But uh, yeah, those OCF shows, it was pretty nerve wracking because not only was I the only drummer, but it was playing very, very quietly. Like probably the quietest shows I've ever played. Um, that was like the the drop album, right? With with Bridget. Yeah. No, it was. Um, we played all the stuff off of um memory of the cutoff head oh wow okay oh and, yeah uh, that's that's what i'm thinking of sorry about that yeah 
Not to you, but I for the listeners, I'm just get shit. It's, for a, it's like similar. I think it might be the same artist who did the album cover. Um, but yeah, we so we did that album in its entirety with a string trio, um, and then we kind of like did a few older rock songs at the end. But like most of that set was played with brushes and mallets, and like I used really really thin sticks, which I never used, like seven A's, just playing super lightly. Um, Cause that shit's gonna break immediately if you. I mean, like if you're playing oh, yeah. harder stuff with Dan. Yeah, but yeah, those those shows were really like the first one, especially. I felt really tense because, like, in every band I've ever been in, you have kind of like you have loud instruments to kind of mask the subtleties, fill in gaps, so, and et cetera. Yeah, so it was the first show where like every tiny little nuance of what I was playing was audible. Which, you know, it halfway through the the first show, I got used to it. But man, I I can't remember the last time I was that nervous before playing a show. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I I I, I bet. I mean, that's such a transition. I mean, really, I would mean, sound wise, and of course, just you solo for sure. I mean, I yeah. I, I can only imagine. Yeah. But uh, I mean that's that's crazy. When um when John said like, hey, you're in the you're in the band, did he give you a, a list of songs like you got to learn these and coordinate oh, yeah. with Dan about them? Do you, do you recall yeah. what those songs were or like what off of what albums? Um, there were. I'm not even exaggerating. I think it was close to thirty songs. <laughs> um, a lot of which we still play today you know like obviously the dream and um uh tidal wave um and then there were a bunch of songs that i practiced with them that we never even ended up playing like dead man's gun which i i love that song i would i'd like to play that one um i'm trying to think there are a bunch of others that we actually ended up playing oh yeah like lupine ossuary um that we ended up playing for one of those live streams um that i had for whatever reason never ended up playing live even though we practiced them a bunch but it was like I, yeah it was around thanksgiving 2016 when i joined and he's like i got these shows in january so just like learn these songs um and we'll start practicing and that's kind of i just listen to him over and over and over again and like like i did when i taught myself how to play drums i just put on headphones and played along to it sure yeah that's that, that, that's the way to really get into it um at what point in between uh thanksgiving and january that january show did you uh you're like hey dan do you want to do you want to work on this oh, yeah. or was it constantly with him we um it's funny because <laughs> Tim happened to, Tim was out of town. So at first it was just me, Dan, and John. And then Dan went out of town for New Year's. So then it was just me, Tim, and, and John. And so we didn't practice as like a full band until I think like maybe like a week before the show. <laughs> <laughs> wow that's that that's like that's not a lot of time but i mean but you guys got it I, i'm assuming right yeah it was cool i mean you know that we instantly once we were practicing as a full band it was like okay i got this i had i had practiced enough on my own and um like you know, those guys are pros you know i will say the difference between playing a show and practicing i learned like right off the bat instantly it was like oh i'm playing like twice as hard and i'm like hitting I, it seriously it was like it was way more of a physical thing than it had ever been at practice within like the first minute of the first song oh wow and um it was really intense and after that first show, I, I was like, every muscle in my body was sore. Hold on one sec. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Go she ahead, should please. be inside. 
if you if you knock, she'll answer. Um, yeah, so I like the first show we did was um, we did two nights actually at Zebulon, and I came home and like, dude, I had, seriously, I I had to like soak in the bath because literally every muscle in my body was sore, and I was like, fuck, I don't know, like I'm gonna have to do a whole tour of playing like this, you know, just. But then I instantly realized the next show I was like. This okay, I got this. It's just conditioning, you know, and I hadn't been used to playing like that. Yeah, definitely. No. Um, when when you joined, it was just John, Tim, and Dan at yeah. that point, and and yeah. then you came in in the Mister Elevator. Exactly. Yeah. Gotcha. And, and Tom had played in that OCS lineup, um, and it you know he worked really well with that so um so john had him play on whatever album that was that he played on the first one that he played on he's like i think i'm gonna ask him to join the band it's like that would be really cool and it it really has been definitely yeah um what what was the first album that you played on if you could remember Orc. orc wow yeah which was like you know, we recorded that in March and I joined the band in January. It was like March or April. Um, yeah. And I played my first, well, I played my first show in January. So like right after we played those shows, it was instantly like, let's write an album. Shit. Wow. I mean, that's, that's pretty in quick succession to one another. I mean, first show and like, all right, let's, let's get this, let's get this album done. Yeah. That's how, that's how he rolls, man. Oh yeah, the work ethic is on with that guy. Yeah. 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 How how many albums have you played on? Um, let's see. So it was Orc, Smoke Reverser, Face Stabber, Fourteen Threat. So it's four, and then there was that live OCS album I played on. In, um, in San Francisco was it? Was that the one? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there, well, there's two live in San Francisco ones. There's one that um, Dan and Ryan played on, like, and then there's that that set that I did where it was all memory of a cut off head and like a few other old ones. Um, so that was OCS live in San Francisco. Wow, I mean that's that's a that's and and then all four that you put out last year, I'm assuming, right? Yeah. I mean, do those count as albums or are they EPs? I don't know how. To I consider them those. albums. I don't know though. I'm I'm not the guy to ask about this. I'm you know yeah. what you know what no. Yeah, I am the authority to say. I'm. <laughs> I I was talking to to Tim about that. And I said, you know what, Discogs, not a reliable source. I said it here. That being said, my my uh, account is terminated. <laughs> really? Not to me. No, no, no. I'm just kidding. No, you can find a lot of shit on there though. Spent. Oh man, yeah, I have it. I had to like, I had to chill on buying records for a bit. Oh um, yeah, technically unemployed. Uh, so I mean, what what was the um, what was the last you you said the the last uh real, quote unquote real show that you uh-huh. played was with Warm Drag, yeah, in January of last year, and then was the next show you did after that the live streams that you did with the OCs. Yeah, we did. Um, it was like a few weeks after that. We did. Uh, it was basically once the pandemic started, once shit really started hitting the fan, um, and like venues were canceling shows, and like South by Southwest and Coachella were canceled. Like all once once shit got real, um, we were like. We were about to record anyway, so John had the idea of just filming one of our practices for like all the new stuff that we had been writing and we're about to record. Um, so that was yeah, that was the first one. At, at, that was at Zebulon, right? Yeah. Okay, got it. Wow. So, so did you feel rusty doing that, or were you like, I, I, I still, I still got no. it. No, no, because we, um, whenever we record an album, we go in like go into the practice space every single day and we jam for like 
an hour or two and he records everything um and then he'll go he'll go home and listen to it and pick apart parts of jams that really clicked and you know the next day be like all right let's let's jam on this specific section you were doing this really cool thing here tim tom you did this paul and dan you did this let's just jam on this and then it slowly becomes a song um or he'll have like a riff and we'll kind of like vamp on that but basically we just we were playing every single day for like hours a day and so when we recorded that thing we were like it wasn't like touring where you're a well-oiled machine but we still had like we had that shit down (laughs) (laughs) yeah what do you uh do you recall your first tour with them yeah um it was in europe oh just straight away just i mean i played i played a handful of shows um like one-off shows but then i think it was in spring i want to say like may or june 2017 is like the first proper tour and um yeah i remember like by the end it's like when you get to that point where you don't have to think about anything you just play and especially like we started incorporating more jammy improv stuff um and that like towards the end we were just kind of like we would come up with throughout that tour we started coming up with tangents that we kind of go off on and jam on and then like having some cues to come back into the regular song Stuff like that that you only can really develop it when you're touring. Yeah, when you're when you're constantly playing ev- like a show every night, and you're like, exactly, I know yeah. what's gonna happen. How yeah. often does the um, how often when you're on tour does it it being the uh, the set list change? Um, it's mostly the same, and we we'll swap out a few songs here and there. Um, I think. I, like I said before, I, I, that would be a dream of mine to like switch it up every night. But at least when we do multi-night runs in the same city, um, I think that especially would be cool. Because I, I have seen people, like if we do three nights in New York, I have seen people at like all three shows, you know. So it's like, it'd be nice to change it up. Um. Yeah, and the kid's got a bucket, and he's puking, and you're like, I've seen this before. Yeah, and, you know, he has <laughs> so many great songs that he's written. Um, I think it'd be, I think that'd be really cool to do. Definitely, yeah. I mean, like, the, the, the catalog is just ever-expanding. There's, there's a lot to pull from. Yeah, that, that'd be yeah. awesome, yeah. That would uh, actually be a dream of mine to do two sets a night. You know, like, Grateful Dead style, where no openers just like come out play 45 minutes take a little break come back out for like another 45 minutes or an hour or whatever do some like kind of jammy air songs and just like switch it up every night yeah i mean that'd be awesome to to see i mean even as a as a viewer it'd be rad i mean i and i can only imagine how awesome it would be to play it yeah yeah because like if you you know especially if you have that set break it doesn't feel like there are some shows we've played where it's crossed the two hour mark and you know, it, like people are, you know, I can tell people are like right there with us. Um, and <laughs> usually we end the show with like a really long song. And so once it hits that two hour mark, when we're done, you can tell like everybody band and the audience were like, okay, we're, we're done. Like there's no, <laughs> shouting for an encore you know it's just like oh all right it's good going. they understand you understand it's a mutual agreement yeah <laughs> yeah man that's that's crazy i can only imagine you play for two hours was there a night or a show that you remember you're like you're just dead tired and you're just like oh my gosh i don't know how i'm gonna get through this no i don't i seriously i i don't let myself get get to that point i i like i mean i'm i'm 43 years old i have to like i 
I view it like sports, man. I I train in the off season. Like I ride my bike. I try to ride my bike every day. I lift weights. I like I have to keep my stamina up. Um and like because I have to play like I'm a fucking twenty three year old, you know? And when I was twenty three I could I could chug twelve beers and play like that you know like really like hitting as hard as i could as fast as i could for two hours and like you know not think anything of it wouldn't affect me in the slightest and go party not afterwards happen. right yeah exactly now i have to kind of like work for it a little more um but yeah i've never and you figure you know it, john it's not relentless there we take we play some slower songs throughout the set just to give ourselves a breather um but but yeah like i've never gotten to the point where i like couldn't do it because i just i won't let myself <laughs> yeah definitely what um what are some of your favorite songs to play live that you like really like this is awesome every time you play it i love playing the dream um a because i love that song and i love that beat um but it's different every time we play it you know because it's one of the songs that we stretch out every time we play it um and it's already a seven some... minute song right i mean that's like the run exactly time yeah but you know we've done that shit like i we've done upwards of like 15 minute versions of that song oh my gosh that's crazy um but it's cool because like it's there are parts where it kind of like cools out a little bit um, and it gets really spacey and then it like dynamically like builds back up and um, yeah, that one, if I had to choose one, that would, that would be it. Yeah, no, it's, it's a good choice. Yeah. And, and I, I'm assuming that, that one, everybody just goes crazy for hearing it. I mean, cause that's like a really popular one. I mean, for yeah, a reason, totally. obviously. Yeah. Yeah, and there, yeah, so I think that maybe factors in too. Yeah, well, what what's the uh, most difficult song to play? Or when you're recording um, it, you're like, this is just a fucking beast of a song. <laughs> you know what? Um, Sentient Una is that that one was a bitch to record, and playing it live can be really tricky because. Um, especially for me, like it's such a, it's a really busy pattern that I'm playing. And it's one of those beats where I'm playing something completely different from Dan, but it works, which are like, those are my favorite beats to play. Or those are my favorite songs to play is like when he's playing almost a completely different thing than me. Um, and it's working. That one. Yeah. And that one in particular, usually with, I play busy, if I play busier stuff, I'm not hitting as hard, but that's one where I'm playing super busy and hitting like really, really hard. Man. And there's just like, it goes through a lot of changes. Um, but uh, yeah, I think I might have fucked that up like once or twice <laughs> live. <laughs> that's I'm awesome. Really hard on my, yeah, I'm really hard on myself if I do that. Oh, you're your own worst critic. I mean, that's that's yeah. with everybody, though. Yeah, I can't let that. I can't let that happen again. When I'm when I'm going through this to listen to it, I'm like, why the fuck did I say that? I mean, I that's constantly. It's every week for me, you know. That's how. Yeah. That's just how it is, though. Trying trying to get past that. But uh, I've gotten to that. If you ever played a show and somebody is genuinely complimenting you, and you're like. No man, I like I fucked up that second song. That wasn't really. That was like one of the worst shows we ever played. It's like just let them. I have to stop doing that. It's like just let somebody give you a compliment. Yeah, my my whole thing like, is it's you. like I I understand like what they're saying and I and I, I appreciate it, and, but I I feel like what I say is not valuing what they're saying. But like oh man, I really like that. Like oh man, I really appreciate that man. Thank you. And I feel like it just comes off like. Like I'm disingenuous about it, and and, and that's just the yeah, whole thing in my head, and I gotta get past that. But yeah, it's like <laughs> that was a great set. No, it wasn't. You're wrong. Did you hear it? Were you there? Because uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't know what show you were watching, but uh, <laughs> it wasn't my. Yeah. Oh man. 
Paul, it was a pleasure, man. Thank you so much. Likewise. But how I, I, I want to wrap this up real quick with, uh, sure. with some promo stuff. You can find Warm Drag's new seven inch at six tones de chair dot right? That's right. That's, that's where, that's where the, the people should go to find that. Actually, you know what? I just got um, a shipment from them yesterday. And so I think next Friday, a week from. Uh, a week from day? tomorrow. Yeah, we yeah. from tomorrow, but I don't know when this is gonna air. No, this is this is gonna drop a, a, a week from tomorrow, so it, oh, this cool. will be out this Friday, that Friday rather. So yeah, next uh, next Friday is um, another free Bandcamp Friday, so we're gonna this, have this Friday, this beat. this Friday that they're listening to this. That's when it is. Right? Some, I thought it was next week. Jesus Christ! All right, <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah, you, this no, Friday. I'm sorry, dude. Not this, not <laughs> this coming Friday, but next Friday is when this is gonna drop. So I'm you know so what? sorry. Just, Forget about the whole don't buy any. No, don't uh, buy it. Whatever, no, it's not worth it. whatever the date, what's the date? What's the actual date of that? The, the actual date that it drops? Give me one second yeah. here. Let me, this is very unprofessional. I'm sorry, sir. Uh, yeah, I try, I try to, to rack these up. Okay, that's going to be the uh, the 26th that it dropped. Right. Okay. So you can buy it from us and you don't have to pay because it's a French label. So you don't have to pay international shipping. You can buy it from us. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So definitely do that in uh, it's streaming wherever you stream music, right? YouTube, Apple, Spotify, Spotify. all that. Pandora, I'm assuming, if that's still around. Uh, <laughs> that and, I mean, obviously you can Absolutely. find <laughs> you can find OC's music wherever you stream music and at theocs.com, right? Correct. Is there anything else you want to plug besides DW? Um, yeah, I was going to say DW, uh, Pearl, Yamaha, Ludwig, give me another just like hit Ludwig. I know you're listening. Yeah, yeah, good. My good. shit's not it's cracked. My bass drum actually is cracked all the way through. I have duct tape. On the uh I mean, are you are you, like when you're looking down on it or like off from the it's side? On the, it's on the bottom so you can't see it, but oh, yeah, okay. it's it's cracked all the way. Through. Oh, you could tape it. <laughs> yeah, oh, I did. Oh yeah, that's I mean that's that's rule number one. I I never get yeah. new heads when when they like go through. I'm like ah, I can tape it, and then once the tape goes through, I'm like ah, I guess I'll oh, tape yeah. it one more time. Remo, if you're listening. I got Remo. You. Oh, and Zildjian, just just throw it in yeah. there too. No, actually, Pisces. Pis oh, I do okay. have a sponsor. I have a, a Pisces sponsorship. It's the only <laughs> sponsorship I have. So <laughs> this is no. what we needed up front. But yeah. seriously though, Pisces, thank you, thank you, and you make great symbols too. Best. Great stuff. Great stuff. The best. Yeah. Paul, thank you so much, man. I'm, I'm going to stop recording this, but I'll talk to you in one second, man. Thank you, dude.